We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hi. Uh, well, we're really lucky to have with us today Cliff Cohen. Cliff is the Chief of Staff of the Service Employees Union. And uh, Cliff, welcome. Uh, he's be been uh, doing union work for many years. He's one of those people making life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness possible, not just words for a lot of people. So welcome, Cliff. Yeah, uh, so we'd like to start. Um, tell us something about uh, where you came from, where you grew up, and uh, uh, where your values came from. We always try to start there because I'm sure a lot of people would like to know this, both yes. members of the union and just people in the public, like who are you? And yes. That kind of thing. Well, it's good to be here. I, I was uh, born in New Hampshire and lived there for a while and moved to Massachusetts. I grew up in a Jewish uh, middle class family. We didn't have much exposure to unions. I, th I think my um, political activism was my parents would vote on election day and, mm. and uh, talk about Democrats and say bad things about Republicans and that was, <laughs> that was sort of it. And uh -huh. then um, when I went to college, I, it was when um, Ronald Reagan started the uh, the um, draft registration, and I got a little agitated mm. and started mm. organizing around that. And oh, then, really? then, yeah. then when when I was in, um, got went to some anti-intervention rallies, and okay. when I was in graduate school, I got involved in the, the yeah, anti-apartheid work and the, hmm. the divestment movement, and and um, that that's sort of my political. Uh, awakening and organizing happened gradually. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that uh, I was born into or you know, was a big part of my, my childhood or adolescence, but mm. it came later. Mm. But what led you to do that? Say, when you were in college, you got involved, you said, in the anti-apartheid movement. I mean, a lot of people probably of your generation in college just I mean, that's kind of far away, South yeah. Africa. Like, why you? Yeah, I mean, just the stories that we read and saw on TV about uh, what was going on in South Africa and how, you know, the people's, uh, you know, the, the horrendous living conditions people were, were under and, you know, how their political rights were, everything that we took mm -hmm. for granted were being denied people because of their race was, you know, just, you know, outrageous. And there was organizers on campus that were, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, helping people get involved and, and uh, you yeah, know, the, the key was that a lot of, you know, corporations were involved in profiting off of mm -hmm. what was going on in South Africa and, <coughs> and um, you know, you went to a gas station, Shell Gas was, uh, you know, the, the profits that you were giving them, some of it was being used in South Africa. So mm -hmm. that's how, that's a connection that I made. And yeah, but I was wondering, like, why did you give a hoot? So, you know, a lot of people went to the same gas station and said, fill her up, buddy, and yeah. that's cool, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, and to make a connection between, you know, filling your car up in Danvers and yeah. South Africa, that's, I mean, where did that come from? I, you know, I, I don't know if I have the answer. I was just, you know, I was <laughs> well, outraged by the, the, the un, un, injustice really? of it all and, um, oh. and that, uh, 
you know, sort of realized that, you know, we, we could make a difference by, by huh. organizing, and, um, and that's how I got involved. Uh -huh. You didn't have any, you have some idea, I, mean, I know you said your parents said nice things about Democrats and not so nice things about Republicans and went to vote, but I was wondering, you know, a little bit, if you have some sense of where those values came from, I'm not yeah. sure, you know. Yeah, I mean, we, we, my family wasn't terribly religious. We went to temple a couple yeah. times a year, um, you know, um, may, maybe, you know, I, ju I just had, you know, may maybe it's from the little bit of you know, religious training I had that, mm -hmm. you know, social justice was something that we, c we cared about. Um, oh, really? Um, but it was, but w there was no activism in my family until, you know, I went off to college. But there was something in the religious training you had around justice? I don't know. I, I, yeah. can't, I can't really pinpoint yeah. how it happened. Interesting. But it happened it in happened. some way. Yeah. And, and you said there were organizers on campus. This was at Clark where you yeah, were? Yeah, Clark University. There yeah. was, um, well, it was mostly faculty who were um, hmm. organizing around the uh, um, um, draft registration campaign. Oh, really? And then oh. there were, there were, you know, there were various, I don't there were, there were some left groups that were there doing anti-intervention anti work in, in Central America. Mm -hmm. So I remember going to, you know, getting on buses and going to D.C. Oh, really? in the early 80s um, huh. around, uh, you know, various, um, yeah, um, to stop various, you know, interventions that were happening in, in yeah. Central and South America. That's a long trip, taking a bus ride from Worcester to Yeah, yeah, those DC. Old, long yeah. trips. Yeah, yeah. And, and who interested you in that? Do you remember... Like how you got interested? I don't. You said faculty. I know. Yeah, mostly, f yeah. There was. Um, I know there was a uh, professor Ross who was oh, involved. Bob Ross. Yeah, was very involved yeah. with. Uh, sure. They were teaching. You know, the old-fashioned teach-ins that were, mm -hmm. were happening around those issues were common mm -hmm. on campus, and um, <coughs> yeah. It, so that I think that's how I got involved. Well, that's great. And then uh, you've been uh, worked. You've worked in the labor movement for a long time. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit how that happened? How you got into Union organizing. And yeah, so I was I was went to graduate school after wow. after undergrad and um, realized I, I probably should have taken some time off. So I, mm -hmm. um, I I got a job at a small psychiatric hospital in Somerville called right. Central Hospital, where I was mm -hmm. a me mental health worker, and mm -hmm. um, we we a bunch of us got together because the c the conditions there were pretty bad. We made up five dollars an hour. There was understaffing. Wow. Wow. The, uh, the, it was unsafe for the clients and the staff, and we and we wow. um, realized we sort of realized that you know there were things called unions out there, which <laughs> I didn't really know much about. But we actually went through the yellow pages and really found a union. There, that's, there is such a thing yeah. called the yellow pages, or was thirty years ago, yeah. right? And found one that uh -huh. seemed like it was related to the work we did, and we oh. called them. And really, it's great. <laughs> an organizer came, and we charted out the hospital and figured out where everyone worked and. Had lots. We developed a little organizing committee, um, mm. and in Rio, and that that really was the <laughs> turning point where I re realized that if working people got together and huh. and, 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 and uh, coordinated their efforts, they could change things at work. Uh, our organizing campaign got crushed. You know, there was the the company, you know, um, scared a lot of people, told them they'd be fired if the union came in. The really? hospital would close. You know the um, you know they, they said they were going bankrupt and the union would push them over the end. So hmm. nothing came. The campaign didn't succeed, but I sort of caught the uh, the organizing bug at that point and hmm. wanted to um, you know work uh, organizing workers after that, and, mm -hmm. so, and that's sort of sent me off in that direction. And aside from the low pay, you also said it was dangerous. I think you said you once got hit or something. Yeah, yeah. When when hmm. uh, in a psychiatric unit, when people are having you know f a flare-up of their mental illness they c sometimes things can be unsafe um, mm -hmm. and there w was not an enough staff to keep them really? s the client safe or this or the staff so yeah there were there were restraint in, in those days restraints of people with mental illness happened more frequently and so I, I you know I remember getting assaulted and you know the cli you know, clients assaulted each other it was, um, wow. it was it was mostly related to not having enough staff on and right. that was you know, related to the, the way the company you know, deployed its resources. So it was bad for the workers, and it was also bad for the people with mental illness. That yes. They were themselves being hurt. Exactly. Right, because 
And so why do you think the company was so reluctant or more than reluctant to allow the union in? I, mean, I, I think it's the typical story that in, in it, uh, companies, whether it's a hospital or a factory, <coughs> the, the owners the directors have almost complete control over everything, uh -huh. you know, the, and sure. so when the work when workers mm. organize and form a union, the, the company has to share some decision making powers, mm. and um, and that's a loss for them. You know, mm -hmm. they, uh, I'm not going to shed a tear for them, but it's a loss for when you lose some power. And for for profit companies, which this hospital was, it, it, it was a for profit. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it means th there'll be less money mm. going to the. In this case, it was a family that owned a couple psychiatric hospitals. They would have less money for themselves, and um, so that that's why they resist. Yeah, yeah. And so now, uh, tell us a little bit more. A lot of people don't know a lot about unions. What are some of the benefits, aside from you mentioned about pay and safety, yeah. that comes from uh, uh, joining a union, or what can come if you're yeah. successful anyway? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a, a union is. You know, basically at its core is about solidarity of, of people at a work site or a company mm -hmm. standing up for each other and protecting each other. So uh, you do that through the bargaining process where you, you negotiate a contract so the, the new, that everyone has clear rules about how you're going to be mm -hmm. treated and it, it, it uh, eliminates favoritism. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, um, you know, if, a, if, a, if the boss wants to or a supervisor is unfair to a group of workers. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, the, sure. the union contract is a way to, in in the in people coming together through the grievance process, is a way to you know to resolve those problems. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a it's it, there's financial advantages. The you know a worker at a unionized company makes you know significant more than the same mm -hmm. worker at a non-unionized company. That helps for life, yeah. liberty, and pursuit yeah. of happiness. Right. Harder pursuit of happiness when you're working three jobs to right. pay your rent. Yeah. Well, exactly, and, and then you have the opportunity to be treated with fairness on the job. Uh -huh. And so those, uh, the fairness and the economic advantages is, is yeah. why, you know, polls show that, you know, well yeah. over 60 percent of the Workers in this country want to be in a union, right. and the, wow. the problem yeah. because of all those advantages. The problem is that yeah. the legal mechanism, mechanisms for getting a union are, are very complicated and right. uh, w you know way outdated. Right. You mentioned grievances. Can you explain like what that means? Uh, you know, yeah. you and I may know, but a lot of people may not know. Yeah. Give me like an example. Yeah. So like an uh, example would be say overtime. There are overtime opportunities at a company mm -hmm. or, or work site. The contract might say that uh, overtime has to be given to the most senior person first, or put mm -hmm. out for volunteers first. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just clear rules. So and that's part of the contract. Yeah, so yeah. it's not like, hey, I like Cliff, so I'm going to give right. him, or I don't like Cliff, and I'm going to give it to him, or whatever. Right. Yeah. right. So, the, so if a company were to not follow that uh, that mm. contract language, then that you can file a grievance saying that the company violated the contract, and then and then most grievance procedures result in a the end result is a, a neutral <coughs> arbitrator will then issue a decision mm -hmm. whether the whether the company was um, violated the contract, and then the company is bound to follow that arbitrator's decision. Okay. Most cases don't go to arbitration, but the it's fact expensive. I know it's expensive, and, yeah. if, and if the company knows that they're going to lose, they will they will then settle. Right. So at least gives an opportunity rather yeah. than just going home and kicking the dog or your right. partner or something. In, in non-union places, the, if you raise issues, the company. The boss often says, "Well, if you don't like it, you can go work somewhere else." Right. Exactly. And good luck with that. Yeah, right. Or yeah. yeah. Or lump it. Or yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. yeah and I know uh, your union, SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, and, uh, has a lot of workers organized uh, by the state of Massachusetts. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. What's it been like organizing uh, workers who are state employees? Um, so yeah, so we, we represent about 8,500 social workers right. who work for the state um, in a variety of state agencies, and uh, you know the workers who work for the state are no different than workers who work for a private company. They mm. you know they want um, a decent wage. They want sure. to be treated with fairness. I think with um, st with the social workers, a lot of people go into the work for the state because they want to care for the uh, sure. abused, and neglected kids or people with mental illness, yeah. and then they. They realize that that's their first um, um, avenue to, to, to 
to coming to the state, but then they realize that if you know if, if the caseloads are too high or there aren't mm. enough workers in the, in the office, then they can't deliver the service that they want. So some right. people get involved with the union because of, they want to improve the quality of service for the clients. Right. And um, and but I think state workers are no different than any other any other group of workers. Mm -hmm. And how's the state responded? I mean, you mentioned the private company at yeah. the. Somerville Mental Hospital, which you know said yeah. we're going to close down and yeah. you're going to lose your job. Uh, what's been the state's reaction, or uh, you know, yeah. over the years you've been doing this? Yeah. And st state workers got cl in, in in this country. Um, states have to pass laws state by mm -hmm. state to get collective bargaining rights, and mm. state workers in Massachusetts have had those rights since sometime in the 70s before I was um, mm. um, when I was still in high school. Yeah, and, um, right. And the uh, you know I think this you know a lot of managers you know would you know would rather not there be a union but they mm -hmm. but it's a political reality and they learn to deal with it mm -hmm. um, and but I think we've dealt with you know uh, unlike private companies and state government you know the political parties sort of you know there's an election and a new new person comes in to mm -hmm. run becomes the new new head boss and but I think whether you're they're Democrats or Republicans. They'll realize the union in the in the organized mm -hmm. workers are here to stay. So there's there's not a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of um, animosity like there are, is in other states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you also said a lot of people that you organize are social workers, mental health workers who yeah. get into the work because they want to be helpful to people. Yeah. And I noticed uh, you've told me the union itself has done a lot of bargaining, not so much just for the improvements for the workers themselves, increased pay, better vacation stuff that the individual workers like, but what you call a uh, common good, I think. Yes. Uh, you know, so if, uh, maybe you can talk about that because I think that's something a lot of people don't know about. You mentioned, mm. I think earlier, you've worked with foster care workers and tried yeah. to get the state to improve, yeah. not so much life of the workers, but for the, the people in general. Can yeah. you describe that? Because that's, I think, really interesting. Yeah. So I think it's a continuation of like the whole history of organizing is that people mm. like people who have some strength and power, if they don't sort of share that mm. and and bring more and, and um, help other people organize and get power, then mm. then you're isolated. And you know, to, just to go mm. backwards a little bit, you know, in the in the uh, 50s and 60s. Mm. Uh, uh, auto workers and steel workers use their clout to give to get state workers collective bargaining in in oh, other really? sta in other states really huh. and then in so sort of continuing that thread you know, we realized that um, you know state workers could do a better job um, serving their clients if we use some of our strength and power to improve services for people we we, we work with so mm -hmm. in bargaining we we've we've often pushed for um, for for example for DCF social workers DCF is uh, Department of Children and Families. Right. They they right. help uh, abused and neglected kids in Massachusetts wow. and help th help their families. Must be a tough job. It is. Yeah. It's uh, it's wow. uh, it's very tough. Um, yeah. And so we've been, we've gone to bargaining and to try to raise the rates for foster families because there's, mm. there's a big problem in the child welfare world where foster families get very little resources to, uh, even though they're taking on kids to help resources them. like money to yeah, pay yeah. for kids they, you and they, I are both parents yeah children end up costing they, a few yeah, pennies they, I mean there are many lasting they values, need to eat but they need clothes I know right so on. whatever um, right. cell phones so, you know, yeah. so we've tried to use the political yeah. strength of the union to try mm. to raise rates for foster families because we know that really? will benefit the the, uh, the families that we work with Right, um, makes the kids happier. Pursue happiness. It's hard when you don't have money to, you know, buy decent food for the kids. You know, ex exactly. Take them out for pizza once in a while. You yeah. know, yeah. exactly. And we've, um, you know, we're we're in bargaining as we speak with the state, the Commonwealth of Mass. Oh, really? and we, we have similar proposals that deal with climate justice, climate justice, and racial really? justice. That even though they're not technically, <coughs> um, you know. Um, oh traditional bargaining issues, we're, we're trying to use uh, um, oh. the, the, the strength that we have to improve things in the community, yeah. um, particularly around, you know, uh, lots of different issues, but the but climate justice, racial justice are, are two of the ones we're focusing oh. on now. And have you had uh, success doing that, like raising the 
uh, wages or pay for foster parents? I, I think we're making progress. There, yeah. There's more and more uh, talk on Beacon Hill and in the advocacy community about the uh, rates needing to come up. Uh -huh. uh, we're also um, um, or organizing foster parents in, in you know in, in a bigger way to, to try to you are yourself you know using your staff to yep, yep. talk to foster parents who aren't members of the union correct correct just to help them yeah yeah well, that's great help them get yeah. more strength and um, yeah so I think we're making you know we're so we're using using our um, you know, the, the um, leverage that we have to try to improve things in the community, not just um, not just for at, us at the bargaining yeah. table. I, yeah. And, and um, this year, our um, union voted to, um, we, we put the question out to the members, should mm. we focus just on work site issues mm. at the work site, or should we f uh, get involved in in broader community campaigns to improve, mm. to uplift the community. Really? And the result was overwhelmingly, we should, we should do both. Really? We fight at work and um, huh. Improve things in the community as a whole. So we, the, our, um, we had an annual meeting this fall where uh, it was unanimous to uh, support a number of campaigns that not that don't affect just the members but affect their communities as well. So this means our union members pay dues and can hire staff like you and other people. So that right. means some of that money that they're paying goes not just to help themselves but. Can you describe a little more about that? I mean, that's pretty interesting. What are the yeah. other areas they're trying to improve in the community? So what, one is around racial justice. Hmm. Um, w another one is around climate justice. Hmm. So like we're, like for climate justice, a concrete example is we're um, involved in co coalitions to divest state pension funds from fossil hmm. fuel companies. Oh, really? We're, um, hmm. we're working on you know, is more of a worksite issue, but encouraging the the Commonwealth to allow workers to work from home, because uh -huh. uh, the 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 you know the gov the governor has said, and in, in most politicians have encouraged private companies to allow their employees to work from home occasionally. Or right, get off the road, exactly. keep your car at home, and so we you have a car. Yeah, so it will help with you know the environment. It will help with traffic just, jams. Yeah, right. it'll help. Yeah. It'll help everyone. Right. Hopefully, so right. so we're in, in bargaining now. Trying to convince the administration to allow state work, you know, to have like real clear numerical goals of how many state workers can work from home really? each each year. Oh, that's great. Are there other areas you're doing that besides foster care and uh, work from home? Uh, there's health care reform. You know, we're all, you know, we've always been pushing for universal health care and making sure that everyone has access to affordable care. Uh, there's uh, education, both um, you know. The, that the fact that your your zip code shouldn't determine the quality of your education. Right, it does. Right. And we're doing a lot in student debt relief. Um, oh, really? You, you were telling me about that. What's going on with that? You said you got some money for yeah. So we, we recently settled uh, settled made an agreement with the Commonwealth to create a um, training fund to train state workers um, in a variety of areas. But a, but a, a, a part of that money is going to be used a million dollars to reduce student debt. Burdens for for our members, um, uh -huh. so that um, that was just announced a couple weeks ago, and we're in the process of rolling that out. And then we have also secured two million dollars for uh, scholarships for our members and in, in their in their children. Mm -hmm. And so that 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 falls into the, you know the cat you know that that category of mm -hmm. that, uh, of uh, education justice. Mm. And, and why do you think your members? Uh, voted to do things because it was a vote. I assume yeah. it's democratic. It's, they yeah. decide where their yeah. dues money goes. What do you think they decided to work beyond just the traditional, you know, yeah. I want more pay and better vacations and whatever else, you know? I think people understand that, you know, there, there are big complex mm. societal problems that mm. affect, affect them every day and that the union, j by just focusing its attention mm. on an employer, can't you know? Can't solve um, all the other. Can't address all the other issues that are affecting mm -hmm. a family, a family's life. So, um, I think it, it was. I can't say it was mm. just common sense, but it, it, it people. I think people understood that there are mm. bigger issues out there besides, mm. you know, whether you know how you were treated at work, and they wanted the union to be part of those campaigns. Mm. And do you, as a leader, play a role in that, and do other? staff people, you know, I mean, obviously people are going to listen to you or the other yeah. uh, elected officials. How does that work? Well, we, we have, 
Yeah, a union is, we haven't talked about this too much, but a union is a democratic organization where you know, the, the, the members get to vote on who their representatives are mm -hmm. and, and who their stewards are and who the leadership of the union is. And mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we, we have a conversation with, with the um, uh, various uh, rank and file leaders in the union about mm. these strategies and ideas and, and you know, it, it takes a number of years to sort of you know, develop a campaign, mm. but over the last few years we started having these conversations and it was clear that you know, a, a, a broad group of members in the union want to go in this direction. So mm. it's, it's, it's a lot of meetings, it's a lot of discussion, a lot mm -hmm. of getting feedback. Um, a lot of surveying and uh, some polling and, um, really cool. and a, lot of, a lot of hard work of people getting together and drafting resolutions and, really. and talking about you know, um, you know, how far to support it. You know, democracy is, what do they say, the worst system except for all the others, yeah. you know. So before democracy there was a plague of taxes, now there's a plague of meetings, you yeah. know, so there's <laughs> lots of meetings. But that's, and you have how many members, 8,000 or more? Well, we, total we have um, almost 20,000. 20,000 members. It, it's not wow. just the state workers, we represent um, almost 7,000 human service workers who work at private agencies who oh, contract right. with the state. And group homes. Group homes, like, wow. social workers. We represent right. um, family child care providers who deliver. Oh, really? In um, their own home. In their own home. Wow. And um, that's and a then, tough job. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. And it, and uh, a, a few thousand faculty at the universities in Boston who are adjuncts or oh really? They get paid really poorly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I did that once. I couldn't believe how little they were paying. I mean, it was crazy. Right. So we only have a few minutes to end up. But I, I think what are the uh, what do you think the most important lessons you've learned? You've been doing this now for decades. Uh, that you've learned both about yourself and about workers and organizing. What what would you say are those lessons? I think I think the most. Um, I mean, one big lesson is mm. about uh, I think about listening and, mm. and that um, when you're talking to workers, whether you're organizing. A, a new, you know, a group of workers to form a union, or, mm. or you're working on some other campaign. It's it's, it's very important to listen to people's mm. stories, what what they're concerned about, and mm. and um, you know, trying to connect those stories to the, to the campaign mm. that that it, that were that you're involved in. Mm. Um, uh, you you, uh, you know, for for people to take action to change their you know, their working lives or to change their community. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you 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 have to you have to know you have to listen to where people are coming from and then mm -hmm. and then um, um, <coughs> you know help 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 um, you know you know and then the, and then identify identify leaders you know who wanna mm -hmm. you know who, who wanna take action to improve their situations mm -hmm. so I think it's mostly about listening that that's what you've done for a long time yeah right I would say listen don't sell you yes. know you can't say have I got a union for you yeah you know it's that doesn't, doesn't really that doesn't work well no no, no. people will say like yeah I've been sold toothpaste and cars and everything else but yeah, yeah so uh, you, do you have any particular memories of things that were particularly uh, over the years we only have like a minute left you know but um, things you, you remember where you learned this like you know listen don't sell and mm -hmm. Is there any particular highlights that are important for people to know? Um, I, um, I, you know, I'm just thinking of the over the years. There's been mm. a, a lot of uh, uh, me members that I've recruited to be activists and leaders in the mm -hmm. union, and um, I, I, I can't think of one in particular that that sticks out. But yeah. um, I think. Um, I think just just think taking the time to learn someone's story and mm -hmm. um, and um, encur encourage their their development as a leader, and um, I think some people need a little pushing, and mm -hmm. um, I think you know you know people don't generally naturally you know volunteer to do things. I think people have to be asked and encouraged, mm -hmm. and I think just the fact of asking someone to play a role is is, is um, you know can be very rewarding for them, and and right. uh, if you know. Sometimes if you don't ask, nothing will happen. So you have exactly. to you have to ask. You don't ask, you don't get. Yeah. Right. No, yeah. thanks a lot. Uh, so I really appreciate your coming in, Cliff, and letting people know about how a union like the Service Employees 
uh, Local 509 can help people get some life, liberty, and hopefully enable them to pursue happiness. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah.